Um, we're in the middle of a series that, um, that we call Acceleration Success. God is writing a story of your life, and we all want to be successful. But I've realized that we are not in heaven yet. Um, I don't know about you, but at times there's an opposition on the other side that wants to oppose you in your life, um, and sometimes it's very frustrating. Other times it's actually God allowing a few things to happen in your life so that your character can be built and you can, you can come to a place where you mature in God. So last week we've handled um, the tactics of the devil and how he opposes us. And also we gave some practical examples of how in your life, how to handle opposition. Now to just give you a, a background again a little bit about the story of Nehemiah. Um, he was in uh, a Persian country, and he was a cupbearer to the king there. And God spoke to him and said to him, Nehemiah, I want to use you to go back to the city of Jerusalem, the capital of the Jews, and I want you to go and rebuild the walls of the city with my nation, with the Jews. And, um, and Nehemiah said, Jeremiah sent me, and he went back to Jerusalem, and they've built, rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem in record time. But quite a few things happened with the nation and with the Jews during that time, and we've dealt with that in our series. But this morning we want to not just acknowledge the opposition that comes our way, but what we've also seen is how Nehemiah handled conflict, how the Jews handled conflict in life. Remember last week we spoke about how is the opposition going to come against you? He's going to ridicule you in certain ways. He wants to resist you in certain ways. Um, and then at the end of the day, um, he wants to spread rumors about your life. And out of that, he wants to get you to a place where you are without hope and totally discouraged. And sometimes he gets that right. That's why we need to get to the practicalities of get back to God reinforce your weak points, all of those practical thing, things that we spoke about last week. Um, but I think what we want to deal with this morning when it comes to conflict, I want to handle a fourth tactic of the devil. Last week we did discouragement, danger, ridicule, resistance, rumors, but today I want to touch a little bit around how the devil uses division and discord in our lives, especially for us also in church life. Um, we're going to look into that area. They tried to create internal conflict with amongst the Jews themselves. In other words, you know what's so amazing is that um, chapter 4 was about the opposition from the outside, other nations, other enemies, Sanballat, and the people that, non-Jews. But now in chapter 5, it goes over where the Jews are gossiping and doing things amongst one another that's not according to the Word of God. It's internal opposition. And I want to say to you, internal opposition for me is much, much worse um, because it's sabotaging from the inner circle. It's, sometimes it's even the closest people around you. Um, why? Because Satan tries to bring division amongst us. Um, a lot of times, he uses money. Even with the Jews there, he's used money. I mean, isn't that typical? More conflicts are caused by finances than anything else. Even the majority of divorces are because of financial problems. My question is, if the devil did it way back then, does the devil still use division today? Of course he does. Internal problems destroy a lot of churches. One of the biggest churches in America at this point in time goes, they're going through a massive transition and a massive problem. The whole elderly board resigned and the two senior pastors just because of the things we are talking about from last week and today. And I think that's why it's so important that we must know how to deal with conflict. And I want to say to you, that's why it's so important for us to have harmony in our church family. Unity and harmony is one of the most important things for me because you know what? If you 
know the vision of our church family and our flavor and what we do, then God wants you to not sow division. He wants you to be united as a family and in unity it commands a blessing. Um, Mark 3.25 says, If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. I see it a lot in, 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 sport, in the sports arena um, with my son. Uh, last year, under 14, I just watched some of the games that they played. It's supposed to be a unit, 15-man rugby game, having a plan and a unit. But for some of these guys, they are selfish and they want to do their own thing, and they want to go and, and do the try and get the ball and kick the ball. And, and you know what? You lose your game if you just do it on your own and try to do things out of a selfish perspective. And God doesn't want us to have that. Um, in life, I want to say to you, if you don't deal with conflict, and a lot of people are not dealing with conflict because they are intimidated, or they have a fear of failure, or fear of rejection. So they'd rather keep quiet. And I want to say to you, that's the wrong way to handle conflict. If you don't handle conflict, God's work is going to stop in your life. You'll be at base number two, and then you get stuck at base number two until you go to heaven, unless we deal with the conflict and goes on. Because you know what? If you harbor resentment or harbor some things in your life, and you don't deal with that conflict, you filter everything through that lens of rejection or whatever your name is for that thing that you keep in your heart. And God doesn't want us to have that. He wants us to deal with that. If you're going to be successful, you've got to learn how to resolve conflict in your life. So that's why it's so important for us. Um, this whole chapter in five deals with conflict management. If you have a look at the first five verses, um, it talks about the causes of conflict, and then the rest from verse 6 to 13 is the cure for conflict. So let me first handle with Lizzie the, the whole thing of the cause of conflict. And again, the background to the story is that the people, remember, they've been spending, spending the majority of their time building the wall, rebuilding the wall. They did not have any time to cultivate their gardens and raise food. Listen to verse 1 and 2. It says there, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry against their fellow Jews. Some were saying, We and our sons and daughters are numerous. In order for us to eat and stay alive, we must get grain. So in other words, there we see the very first complaint from within the ranks, within themselves. The first complaint was food shortages. It's too many mouths to feed. And the very next verse even said, we find out that there was a famine during that time. So resource and goods were in short supply. There were more mouths to feed than they had food. It's like inflation, high prices, the petrol's going up all the time. I don't know if some of you sit with some of these issues in life, but it's very real for us. You know what's also interesting for me is the fact that while they are doing God's work, God allows for um, a famine in the land. And I'm like, but I'm doing your work, God. And God's saying to us, you know what? We're not in heaven. We're not going to skip ordinary stuff that happens in our lives. Your car breaks down. Don't bind the devil. I see Alam Tien Vurdagni. He's in Pakistan. Maybe it's just life that happened. The car just broke down. And, uh, and we need to then handle some stuff in our, in our daily lives. So the first complaint was food shortage. Then if you go on to the second complaint was that they were over-mortgaged in their homes. It's terrible, actually. Verse 3 says, We are mortgaging our fields, our vineyards, and our homes to get grain during the famine. You know, that's what you call financial bondage at the end of the day. They were using their equity to feed their families. I mean, they were taking their equity out of their homes and mortgaging them deeper and deeper just to put food on the table. Two of the complaints, Lizette, I think. Let me read to you verse 4. It says, yeah. Still others were saying, that's the third one, we've had to borrow money to pay the king's taxes on our fields and vineyards. 
If you go on, you'll see that not only were they burdened with heavy taxes, their children were being sold as slaves because they couldn't pay their debts. I think, let me just read that scripture to you. Um, It says in verse 5, Although we are the same flesh and blood as our countrymen, and though our sons are as good as theirs, yet we have to subject our sons and daughters to slavery. In other words, they even sold their children so that they can get food on the table. Now, just imagine this. How hard it must be. How hard it must be for them in those times. But you know what? If we have a look a little bit further, these hard times were not the root problem of the conflict. Um, Look, it says in verse 1, Now the men and their wives raised a great outcry, what? Against the Jewish brothers. What were they complaining about? You know what? They were complaining about the rich taking advantage of the poor, exploiting the poor in times of crisis. They were taking advantage and capitalizing on the misfortunes of the poor. Um, those actually who had money and had food were saying to the others, you know what, if you sell me your house, even your children, and I make them slaves, I will give you food. I'll lend you money, but it will be at a high interest rate. And if you can't pay the loan, I'll take your children. They were actually exploiting each other. And you know what, in life, the life that we face, even our dear brothers and sisters, we do that to one another. Where God actually wants us to reach out to one another and help in times of need. Rather than helping and giving to the poor, they are charging high interest, they are repossessing their homes and taking their children as slaves. What they are actually doing is they are actually just thinking about themselves. Me, me and my little castle, and what I want, and what I'm going to do. This was clearly against God's law, because you know what, if you go into the laws of the Jews, according to the Old Testament, um, Jews could not charge interest to each other. God allowed them to charge interest to other people, but not to themselves. They were allowed to loan to each other, but they couldn't charge any interest. The Bible also said that the Jew was not to enslave another Jew. He could come and work for you, but not enslave them, not by violating those laws. So in other words, there's something deeper here, and it's deeper in your life too. And Lizette, that's, that's the root cause of conflict in life. Yes, I think the root cause of internal conflict. So that's not external conflict, something that's attacking you from the outside. Internal conflict in a church, in a family, in a business, when we turn on each other, is selfishness. And if you, if you read the story, you'll see that the rich Jews were selfish. And they took from the poor ones. And it happens, that, that discord, that selfishness happens in marriages, it happens in families where I have seen many families ripped apart by a will. I have seen marriages ripped apart by selfish needs. I had a friend who got married at a quite um, mature age, and she asked me, why do people divorce? And I said to her, because they're selfish. Life is about give and take. So the biggest factor for internal conflict is selfishness whether you have conflict in your family, with your boyfriend or girlfriend in the church, in your office, at school, the bottom line in conflict is always selfishness. It's always like that. James 4 verse 1 says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? It's like my wants conflicts with her wants. And that's how we need to resolve this at the end of the day. And I mean, people tend to be selfish, including me. Because at times you want your way. Because that's how you see it. It's not how others see it, but that's how you see it. So that's why we need to speak about this. And what is the cure of conflict? That's where we're going to go to now. And there's five of them. The five ways that God wants us to handle conflict. Um... The question that I'm asking is, how does a Christian resolve conflict? 
I think for Nehemiah, he knew that his, this whole thing can actually could blow up into his face and they never will be able to rebuild the wall again. And they were exploiting each other. They had Jews fighting against Jews. They had families fighting against other families. I mean, we saw that in verse 1. The men and their wives raised a great outcry against their own people. This is actually much worse than fighting an enemy out there. An external enemy often rallies the troops and it builds unity. But you know what? When it's amongst yourself, it causes disunity, disharmony. It causes disunity. So, step one in verse one, it says there, when I heard, Nehemiah says this, when I heard the outcry and these charges, I was very angry. It's fine to be angry. Some of you actually need to get a bit of anger in you. Some of you need to tone it down, but some of you need to take some stuff in your life serious. You need to take it serious. Nehemiah did not ignore the problem. He took it seriously. If you're a leader of any group, or a leader of yourself, a leader of your household, or a business, you need to have harmony amongst one another. I fight for harmony in my family. If there's not harmony in my family, it's massive. It's like we cannot continue in life because we need that unity amongst one another because it's there where God graces you. But where there's division and disunity, it's just chaos at the end of the day. Um, if there's not harmony in our church family, I want to say to you, it, it's it's it is awkward, man. Um, and God wants us to fight for that. Because you know what? Then it's a gossip here, and it's a this, that, and it's a whole sowing of critical uh, spirit and, and nonsense, which is not the truth. And God wants us not to have that. And that's why sometimes anger is very appropriate. It's the right thing to do. I mean, this verse says, Nehemiah was very angry. You know that anger is commanded by God. Ephesians 4.26 says, Be ye angry and sin not. All that God asks you to do is not to sin in your anger, to take revenge. I will show you. No, 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 no. He doesn't want you to do that. He wants you to become angry at that situation that causes division at the end of the day. He wants you to be real in that situation with him. Jesus got angry. God got angry. You can get angry and not sin. I think one of the first things you need to do, if there's disharmony that is caused by selfishness, you as a Christian, it's like you better get angry and take it serious with the right kind of anger. Nehemiah's anger is not a personal reaction to what has happened. Nobody was hurting him. He's not getting angry and striking back because somebody bruised his ego. That's the wrong kind of anger. He's not striking back in revenge. That's the wrong kind of anger. But what he has is justifiable indignation. He was angry at what? At the selfishness of the rich people. He's deeply disturbed by their exploitation. Because you know what? Even with him going out there and confronting this can halt the entire project of rebuilding the wall. Their own selfishness will be able to do that. And he's thinking, what good is a wall if the people inside the wall are ripping each other off? I want to say to you in life, when you see something that's destroying the harmony in your life, in your family, in your church, in your business, the first thing you actually need to do is to take it serious and get upset. Nothing will get you more upset than division in life. Nothing. If you want to be called onto the red carpet here at Oak Hill, start to sow disunity and division. It's one of the first things where we just call someone in and say, hey, just handle it in the right way. So I've dealt a little bit about anger now. 
It's good to become angry, but then you need to do what Lizzie's going to explain to us now. Yes, we, I got this part because I worked very hard at it. It's called reflection. Think before you speak. And you know what? There were times where Louie and I would sit in meetings and I would be so right and so wrong at the same time. Because I would just talk out of that place of righteous anger. And I'm angry about the right thing and I'm saying the right stuff. But I didn't take a step back. And because I didn't do that, it came out unfiltered and I had to apologize to the perpetrators. And after a few times, I learned a valuable lesson that you need to take a step back. If you read in, in verse 7, um, Nehemiah says, I pondered them in my mind. So after thinking about it, I spoke out against these rich government officials. You need to understand that when you take a step back, it actually says I consulted myself. Mm. And in a world with phones, television, everything going on, I don't know if we think about stuff that much. You know, in, in the old days, I think people would walk for hours to get water. It would just free up some time for you to think things through. And I want to challenge you anew to set some time aside and think about stuff. What's going on? What's really going on here? And when you find that you, you've ordered your thoughts, go to God. Go to God and ask God, what do you want me to say? How do you want me to handle this? I always tell people, I can't believe how much I say, Lord, give me the wisdom of Solomon. Because the stuff that we face are so random, it's so out of the box, it's so big, that after I calm down, and I think I know what's going on, I need to ask God, can you please give me advice on how to handle this? I think you have to be honest with yourself. Our first reaction when we are angry is a little bit yeah. wrong. Moment. You know, you, you kind of jump in there with foot and mouth disease. And, you know, after you've ranted and raved, you don't even have a plan. And I think after many of those sorry moments in my life, I've learned to say, can I just take a moment? Can I come back to you just to breathe? Just to get your heart rate up to a place where you're not in serial killer mode. But you can actually breathe and you can talk this through. James 1, 19 to 20 says, Be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. This is not an antidote to what I'm saying. It's, um, uh, this is an antidote. It's not a contradiction. So what it says is, take a step back, hear what's going on, think before you say something. Because maybe you have a chance to make a change, and because you didn't think it through, you can lose that chance. It's important that, that, that we make a distinction between God's anger and man's yep. anger. When it comes to man's anger, it's got a lot to do with our feelings, our ego, me, 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 and I. And when you get angry, you want revenge. You want to hit back in revenge. When God gets angry, it's not about his ego. He gets angry about something that's not righteous. Mm. And all he wants to do is to set back and make it righteous. Let it be right. This isn't right. That's what God's anger encompasses. Mm. So that's the, the difference between the two angers. I think it's important for us to put value on taking a step back. Because impulsive anger gets us in trouble. That brings me to number three. Number three is rebuke. Now, before I get there, I just again want to tell you that if you see something that's not right and you are quiet, then you are part of that problem. Then you are enabling people to do what they are doing and it's not fair. So step three is the rebuke. You privately confront the offending party. So you go directly to the source. Mm -hmm. You don't visit five or six people, gang up together, mm -hmm. and then go to the source. You don't have a prayer meeting 
and then under the prayer meeting, you gossip and say, Lord, can you please help that Louis? Because I need meat in this church and not milk. And Lord, I know that things in his private life, that is gossip, even under prayer. You have to go directly to the source. And then at first, you limit it to the people that are involved. You know, you limit it to the people that are involved. You don't go to the church first, then take two people, and then speak to the guy afterwards. No, that's not God's heart. God's heart for you is to stay in step and to do it correctly. Notice in verse 7, it says, I pondered them in my mind and then accused. Now, hear me, I was not making a polite social visit here. He's not watering it down. I've sat in conflict meetings where people are confronted and where the person that's doing the confronting is so diplomatic that the people actually walk out there feeling better about themselves. And I'm thinking, am I the only one who missed the issue here? You know, it's like people dance around the subject so beautifully that they never actually say anything about it. You need to say what you need to say and say it as it is. Don't be intimidated. Don't water it down. Go for it. Then step three, privately confront the offending party. I know a lot of you don't like confrontation. I also didn't like confrontation. But the one thing that I learned is if you want to shift an atmosphere, you have to get used to confrontation. And the second thing that I learned is you don't get better at confrontation by not doing it. Mm. The more you do it, the better you get. The first time you go in guns blazing and you blow those poor people out of the water, they haven't even said anything, and you are standing there with smoke coming out of your hair. Then you go to the total opposite side where you don't say anything and you just talk nonsense for half an hour and because you don't want the same reaction. And then God takes you to the middle eventually and he just eases it out so that you do well with it. But you need courage to to confront. In fact, you need courage to be a Christian. It's extremely important for us to confront situations that are not right. A, A very simple example is if you have that person in the office and what they're doing isn't right, and you don't confront it, if you are in, in control of that situation, the morale of all the people in the office will go down. They'll just feel it's so unfair, and this person isn't bringing his part. And it's the same at home. I get so weary of scolding my teenagers that the one will come and say, he did this or she did that, and I'm thinking, I just don't want to confront it. But if I don't confront it, it's just going to bring a wedge in in our family. So it's extremely important that you confront. And I want to encourage you, if you want to weigh your motive, ask yourself, is this for the greater good of this person, this family, this institution, this business? Or am I just irritated and I want them to change? If you know that this is for the greater good, then you know that you are doing the right thing. I once said to somebody, if you really love somebody, you'll confront them. I don't know if you watch idols. If you watched idols, you know those freaks in the beginning? And they sing, and you think, don't you have friends? Somewhere along, someone had to say, I don't think you should go public with this. <laughs> Nobody has the guts to say that. I'm like, maybe you just need somebody to say, don't wear that while doing that. So if you really love people, you'll speak up. You'll say what needs to be said. Yeah, because otherwise they continue to sing, and then the judges just judge them very rudely, and then it's not nice. Have you seen that? Some of them just crack and cry and go out, but a loving friend could have just said, Mm -mm, just don't do that (laughs) so it's okay to be angry and not sin number one it's very important for you to go to God then and be quiet Mm. and to think and ponder upon what has happened and what the selfishness is doing towards you and then thirdly remember 
It needs to be an issue where it affects your life. This is not a license to go out and convict people of sin and righteousness and confront everyone left and center. We're talking about real stuff, the inner circle that affects you. So in other words then, go and confront that. Um, privately, go and speak to the people um, in that way. And then the fourth one, which is actually huge, which we see Nehemiah's doing, is actually a resolution there, publicly deal with public divisions. If you are going to publicly say something against me, I will publicly rebuke you, because that's the way it's been done. I can remember in 2000, when we opened up, sorry, this building with the Children's Church, can you guys remember that? Publicly, we were in the newspapers like one, two, or three, or four times. They publicly uh, opposed us, and I then on the pulpit, publicly came and said, this is not right, this is not how we've done it, this is the way that we've dealt with that. So, if you look at Nehemiah's situation with the Jews, obviously in that situation, everybody knew about what was happening, that the rich people were ripping off the poor people. It had to be dealt with publicly. You deal with things publicly to the degree that they are known. Um, in life, if it's a personal sin, you confess it just personally to God. If it's a private sin between you and another person, confess it privately. If it's grossed out the whole church, then you have to deal with it publicly. And I can count it on my hand just a few times where we had to do those kind of things. Look at verse 7. I pondered them in my mind, and then I accused the nobles and officials. I told them, you're exacting usury from your own countrymen. So I called together a large meeting to deal with them. I said, as far back as possible, we have brought back our Jewish brothers who were sold to the Gentiles. Now you are selling your brothers only for them to be sold back to us. And the Israeli oxy, and they kept quiet because they could, um, they could find nothing to say. So Nehemiah actually just publicly repeats what he told them in private. I mean, he even says when he was in Persia, he bought some of the Jews back to go back to Jerusalem. Um, he used some of his own capital, selling the Jews into slavery to our own people. It just does not make sense. It's inconsistent. Why are you doing it? He's asking them. Um, and what's interesting, the response was silence. Now, can you imagine it must have taken some courage from Nehemiah to do that? I think my broek so gebeur To actually publicly go, I think he was, must have been nervous. It takes guts to do that. He publicly took on the city leaders. He's rebuking the wealthy owners of Jerusalem. Those wealthy owners are the very people that are giving the finances for them to rebuild the walls. Now, he could have asked, well, who's going to pay for it now because I'm confronting them? Um, but no, he goes to their money bags, the very people who are funding and rebuilding the wall. Um, I think the devil is probably saying, Nehemiah, if you're going to call a public meeting here, you're going to lose your support, and this whole project will never be finished. But you know what's so amazing about Nehemiah? He continued... He was committed to doing the right thing regardless the circumstances. So sometimes I just want to encourage you, get over your fear of confronting in life. It shows the integrity of Nehemiah. He doesn't stop there. He goes on to verse 9. He says, so I continued, what you are doing is not right. Shouldn't you walk in the fear of God to avoid the reproach of our Gentile enemies? He's actually appealing to their conscience. Um, he was saying to them, you've got a bad testimony, man. All the unbelievable, ach, unbelievables, unbelievers are laughing at you. So in other words, it's saying the world's laughing at you. And sometimes I feel the example of churches and the way that they handle these things, no matter the world laughs at us because of that, discord is always a poor testimony, always. We don't want to be a fighting church. We want to be an effective church. 
Um, sometimes the world laughs at churches that fight at each other. Then he goes on in verse 10, he says, Give back to those people immediately. My brothers and my men are also lending people money and grain, but not for interest. But let the exacting of usury stop. Give back to them immediately their fields, vineyards, olive groves, houses, and also the usury you, you're charging them. The hundredth part of money, grain, new wine, and oils. He's challenging them to make restitution. Do it immediately. And you know what? Here we see them doing that. The result of that public confronting was they repented in verse 12. And they said, we will give it back. We will not demand anything more from them. We will do as you say. I think at that point in time, Nehemiah must have had a sigh of total relief. It's like, wow. But you know, he even goes one step further in the process. He says, Then I summoned the priests and made the nobles and the officials take an oath to do what they had promised. So, to encourage you, if something happens publicly, this is the way that you deal with that. And then the last one, Lizzie, if you want to deal with that. The last one is just reinforcement, and it's about leading by example. If we look at the very root of everything that's going on here, it was selfishness in people. It was um, making themselves rich, taking care of themselves instead of building the nation, making sure that the nation is getting up and prospering. And I think Nehemiah uses an example. I'm not going to read it to you. I'll tell you the story where he says that as um, the, the governor, he has the right to ask them for food and wine. He can demand it, and the, the guys, the previous guys did it. They had a portion that they could command from the people there. But because he knew it was famine, because he knew there was trouble, because he knew that they were in a bad space, he funded the people in his party that needed to eat out of his own pocket. And he ends this chapter by putting a challenge out there and by saying, you can't expect things from people that you yourself will not do. And I think if, because I work here, I can't expect things from you that I will not do. If you buy a conference ticket, I buy a conference ticket. If I tell you to invite a friend, I invite a friend. So that it's real, so that we go before each other and we walk with integrity in a way that we can look up at each other. If you want to be the person to call people on it, to confront people, you also need to be the person that has integrity. The Bible says, be as innocent as a, as a dove and as cunning as a serpent. And you can't call people on stuff if you yourself don't have a testimony. Before I pray for us, Lizette, won't you just um, take that example of when we do confront the whole thing of love and truth? I always use the example of you, either you have a cart, and that's the message, and then you have two horses. You have love and you have truth, and you need both. You need both of those horses, because if you lose one, then you'll go in circles all the time. And the reason why it's important that you speak to people the truth is the truth sets you free. But if, you, if your motive isn't love then you do that to break them. You don't do that to better them. That's one of the reasons why I can tell people the worst things about themselves is because I know that I will love them through their process. Um, someone once said Jesus could call the Pharisees whitewashed tombs because he knew he was going to die for them. He could speak the truth because he had the love. And some of us love the truth but we don't love the love. And if you don't have both, it will be an inconsistent message and it will destroy whatever you want to take over because one horse can't take the message there. You need both of them in unison. So, to just sum it up this morning, we are having opposition in our lives. That's very real. Some ridicule taking place, rumors about you, resistance about you. We do get discouraged because of life. And out of that, there's certain conflict that arise because of selfish motives and the selfishness of the people around you. 
And God wants us then to handle that. And I truly believe that some of you need that message this morning because you need to start to confront in your life. Others of you, you are forever confronting, but you're doing it in the wrong way. And maybe this morning, God's just giving you a practical tool of when you walk out here, how to do that. So it's okay to be angry. God, God actually wants us to become angry and serious about that selfishness against you. But in your anger, do not sin. That's why love and truth is there. That's why God wants us to set aside time to go and think about how are you going to handle this? Are you just going to throw it out there or are you going to sit with God and remember the Lord and objectively sit down and think about it? And then privately confront the stuff that happens against you. And if there was something publicly, then you can handle that publicly. But God wants us to do that in life. So Father, I want to thank you for every person here today, Lord. Father, we know that we are fighting the good fight of faith and we know that you are doing that for us Lord but it's very real for us to have opposition and Father this morning I just pray Holy Spirit that you will come and fill us afresh and anew with your grace and your power and your ability Father to handle intimidation, handle our fears and to confront those things Father if opposition comes against us Lord give us the ability Father to overcome this, Father, and to get a cure for the conflict against us in the way that we've shared this morning. And I ask that in the wonderful name of Jesus. Amen.